promise me that if you win this race, you will go to Washington as an American, not as a Democrat or as a Republican, but as an American. And that's exactly the kind of congressman that I've tried to be every day. Welcome back to the show, everybody. We have an exciting new episode for you guys this week. And before you jump on me, I get it. I know I say that every week, but I promise you guys, every single week that we've been doing this, I feel like every episode just gets better and better. As we approach the holiday season and Christmas is right around the corner, I just wanna let you guys know that we have about four to five episodes left of this season, which is season number two. And then coming into the new year, we'll be taking a little bit of a break and we'll be revamping and doing things a little bit better for you. So stay tuned for season three, which will be coming up next year. Today, we are excited to be speaking with Congressman Seth Moulton of Massachusetts. Seth served in the United States Marine Corps and deployed multiple times to the Middle East. We get into his military career, becoming a journalist after his service and being embedded with fellow Marines in Afghanistan to running for Congress in his home state. We are honored to have Congressman Moulton on our show, and we hope you guys enjoy this week's episode. Real stories, real heroes, for a real cause. This is Never Left Behind, the podcast. Congressman Moulton, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks very much for having me on, guys. Of course. We're uh, we're very excited to have you on. You know, we're, we were humbled and honored that you agreed to be part of our book, The 20-Year War. Um, and I'm, I'm especially excited to talk to you because, you know, we obviously want to dive into a lot of your military history um, and then, you know, talk about that transition, what it was like for you, and then moving into, um, you know, your role now in government. But then also kind of with everything that's happened in the last couple months, um, I know you've been a pretty major voice and advocate um, for the things that have been happening in Afghanistan, and I definitely want to talk about that a little bit. Um, but, you know, we, we'll start with your service and, and you know, just, just start from the very beginning. What inspired you to join mm. the military in the first place? You know, there was really one person who was most important to me in this decision, the, the greatest mentor I've ever had in my life. Uh, his name was uh, the Reverend Peter Gomes. He was actually the school minister uh, at my college. But a larger than life figure than that. He had the uh, New York Times bestselling author, mm -hmm. one of the most popular courses on campus. And he talked a lot about the importance of service. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, look, I, I wasn't a particularly religious guy, but I listened to him a lot. I went to hear him in church because I felt he made me a better person. Mm -hmm. And when he said, you ought to go find a way to serve after you graduate, I took that seriously. And I looked at options. But... I wasn't immediately committed to the Marine Corps. In mm -hmm. fact, I looked at teaching overseas, Peace Corps, uh, things like that. Um, and then uh, I also didn't have any particular attachment to a, a service. I knew that I wanted to be on the ground. I knew that uh, I wanted to be in the infantry and that basically narrowed mm -hmm. it down to the Army and the Marine Corps. Uh, Navy said they weren't taking anyone at the time. Um, but it took me a while to actually sort out, you know, exactly what, uh, what, what I wanted to do. Mm. But he, he talked about service. And um, when I looked around, I said, I've got more respect for those 18, 19 year old kids who put their life on the line for our country than just about anyone else. Yeah. yeah. And what, what time frame was it, was this? Cause you know, it's an interesting time, you know, nine 11 happening and, and a lot of people, you know, have served the last 20 years because of nine 11 or something, you know, they continue to serve because they were serving before and, and reenlisted or whatever after nine 11. Um, so what time frame was this for you? Yeah. So this was the spring of 2001. In fact, I remember oh, wow. a conversation wow. at his office where, uh, probably about April, 2001, where I said, you know, I've thought a lot about this and I've to, decided to, to join the Marines. And um, <clears throat> he thought about that for a second and he said, well, uh, I don't love your decision to join the military. Um, I think he was coming from his, you know, a peace loving minister uh, mm -hmm. serial point of view. Mm -hmm. But he said, I think you're making this decision for the right reasons. And then he concluded by saying, I'm just glad there's not a war going on because you'd probably get yourself killed. Oh, geez. I think <laughs> you might course, be the, I think you might be the, the <laughs> veteran. A few, a few months later, it was September 11th. And my training actually started 
uh, uh, just after that. So January 2002 is when I actually started training. And, and, you know, you'll appreciate this. That meant that for all of my training, my year of training, I felt like I had just missed the war because oh, wow. Afghanistan was happening. Surely we would be in and out just like we were with the Persian Gulf. Mm -hmm. uh, no one was talking about going to Iraq. Uh, I figured my timing was just wrong. Um, mm -hmm. And little did I know that just, you know, I graduated on December 20th, 2001. Went home for Christmas, Christmas Eve, my future battalion XO called and said, when are you coming out to California? I said, after I use my 30 days of leave. And he said, nope, you're coming <laughs> out next week. Wow. We're getting on ships to head to the Middle East. Were you, did you go to, um, you didn't go to 29 Palms then. You went to San Diego? To uh, that's right. So I was uh, stationed at Pendleton. So I <laughs> was there for uh, about a week. Uh, met my platoon, uh, threw all my stuff into storage and board a ship in, in San Diego and started sailing across the Pacific World War II style. I mean, literally an <laughs> armada geez. of ships, even a submarine or two in there um, heading uh, to the Middle East. It was uh, pretty extraordinary times. And I think that it was a moment in American history where we all felt united. Mm -hmm. We all yeah. felt willing to make sacrifices uh, yeah. for our American values. And I was proud to be in a position to actually do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't appreciate that a lot of the decision making that got us into the Iraq war was flawed. Uh, I didn't appreciate I didn't understand that at the time. Uh, I was just proud to be in a position to actually do something about the terrorist attacks on 9-11 and Absolutely. Uh, very proud to be serving. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think you're the, the veteran that we've spoken to and that's in our book that enlisted that close to the mm -hmm. war and then probably, I would say, maybe even deployed yeah that fast right after yeah there's a very very few in our book that are right at that timing mm -hmm. um well it was extraordinary i mean i ended up in the first company of marines into baghdad um, after we fought our way up uh um the eastern side of the the country um you know doing what i wanted to do leading an infantry platoon um leading these extraordinary young americans who were willing to shoulder burdens that 99 percent of america uh you know, we'll never even be asked to hmm. do, you know, <clears throat> one of the things I remember most that I think really illustrates this is um, the night we uh, got the word that we were actually going to invade. And by the way, we were taking bets. I was on the side of now nah, Bush isn't really going to do this. Um, but sure enough, uh, we got the call to invade, which, of course, came at three in the morning. They couldn't mm -hmm. tell us at a normal hour of day. <laughs> it's the Marine Corps, right? So. Uh, they wake us up in the middle of the night, call us into the CEO's tent. He says, um, give us the quick brief to get the uh, guys up and get them ready to go. And then as I was walking out of the tent, um, he said, oh, Lieutenant Moulton, one more thing. Yes, sir. And he turned and pointed to two incredibly frightened young Marines and said, these two are with you. And it was two 17-year-old guys who had just graduated boot camp were flown straight to Kuwait hmm. and Damn. met my platoon on the morning of the invasion. Jeez. That's crazy. That is insane. And you guys are still rocking old gear Yeah, on top of that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You guys are dealing with dirty stuff reused from I mean, the I mean, Gulf This War. is the time when they came through and issued us sappy plates, which is funny because we had never trained with sappy plates. Mm. No one ever explained what that slot was in your flak vest for so we were totally unprepared for this added weight and so they they issued us two sappy plates and then a couple days later uh came back around and said whoops we don't have enough to go around so you each got to give one back <laughs> jeez <laughs> just hope you don't get shot in the back i guess <laughs> yeah maybe that wasn't even the best though i think maybe the best was when you know re remember the chemical weapons threat was oh real. yeah Mm -hmm. I mean, this wasn't just like, you know, the administration, you know, trying to make an excuse for it. No, we all believe we really thought that we were going to get hit with chemical weapons. This gas mask, uh, everything. It's frightening in that yeah. sense, right? I mean, this is a pretty serious thing. And um, so just before we headed north, they delivered uh, the latest and greatest chemical weapons detection technology to our company, mm. uh, which was a chicken in a cage. <laughs> with a bag of chicken feed oh and they said 
put this in the company Gunny's truck, and if the chicken dies, you might want to put your bass on. Oh my goodness, I've never. <laughs> you That's know, what? I, I've heard of this actually, uh, like from Vietnam era stuff, where yeah. they would take animals with them. It was like if they're sensing something or if they're dying off, then you need to take precautions and protections. I've never heard that though for, for a post 9-11 GWAT. So that's crazy. I'm sure a lot of people listening to this will say, nah, that can't be true. I, it's true. <laughs> that's yeah. crazy. You know, so especially going into that, like, um, cause you had the idea you were going to join, you know, you, you were committed, you were going to join before 9-11. Um, so I, I know for me, even I knew the wars were going on. I joined in 2006, but I had this like romanticized kind of idea of what it was going to be like to serve. Like, how did that play out for you? Did you feel like you were, you were putting forth the service and you were getting what you were expecting or was it, was it all completely new, just abnormal, didn't know what you were really going to be getting into until you were there? It was really a, a mixture of both because on the one hand, I had no idea what I was getting into. I didn't have any um, close friends or relatives who had been in the military. So, uh, I mean, I didn't even understand the rank structure when I first went to OCS down in Quantico. I mean, that's literally how, uh, I guess, ignorant I was. Um, but I was very committed to serving the country. And I think from that perspective, uh, you know, we all really believed in what we were doing. And mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, I really admire... Uh, people like yourselves who signed up uh, knowing, uh, you know, just sort of how bad it could get in Iraq or Afghanistan uh, and also just how, you know, difficult it would be to um, lead troops in a, in, a, in a very politically contentious environment, a lot of disagreements of the war. I mean, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of, um, I mean, I've often said that one of the hardest questions I ever got as a uh, Marine Lieutenant was, sir, mm -hmm. why are we here? You know, in other words, why are you asking me to risk my life for this? Yeah. And that's a hard question to answer. But in the early days, that wasn't as much in the conversation. Maybe it was back home. But for us, you know, we really thought <coughs> we were just doing the right thing for the country and we were proud to be doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you were just there in Iraq then too, right? Or did you do Afghanistan as well? I, I just did Iraq. Okay. Um, when I got out of the Marines and went to grad school, uh, I really wanted to try to understand Afghanistan. Hmm. Um, so naturally when everyone was getting summer jobs on wall street and everything else, I got a summer job in Afghanistan. So, uh, I spent oh, wow. some time on the ground in Afghanistan actually as a journalist embedded hmm. with, um, a Marine uh, unit out in Hel Helmand, yeah. uh, in the uh, summer of 2009, but I was not there as a Marine. Wow. What? That's crazy. That that's crazy. Cause I mean, you knew after serving, um, you know, granted, it's Iraq and Afghanistan, two very different wars, different enemies, but, but still same war. Still, still same global war on terror. Still s combined effort, I guess you could say. Um, what what drove you, I guess, to want to be a journalist specifically, and especially you know diving into Afghanistan? Well, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I, look, I think journalism is incredibly important. It's a <laughs> tenet of our uh, free democracy that you have freedom of the press. Um, but I, I was not interested in a career as a journalist. It was honestly mm. just an excuse to go to Afghanistan. And um, I mean, look, there's a part of me that's, you know, the dumb Marine who always wants to, um, you know, I guess be, you know, by the, I don't know, the sound of the guns or whatever. But, mm. um, but, I, but I had a genuine interest in trying to understand how these conflicts were different. I was in grad school at the Kennedy School at the time, uh, writing about what I had experienced in Iraq and trying to be thoughtful about what our policy should be in these wars going forward. And I noticed that a lot of the veterans who came back from Afghanistan had a very different take on things compared mm. to the veterans who were returning from Iraq. So clearly they were different wars. And look, I didn't really have any credibility to speak about Afghanistan, having not been there myself. So, mm -hmm. so that's why I got this job. And it was extraordinary. I worked for Dan Rather. Uh, wow. A Marine veteran himself, very, very proud Marine. Many people don't know that history. Um, he, uh, I've seen him tear up when he talks about his time in the Marine Corps. And um, so I wasn't, he wasn't there. I was working sort of for his mm -hmm. program, um, but got out there embedded with Marines. And, uh, you know, I really tried to not use my Marine connection. I was like, look, I'm, I'm here as a, as a, I'm out, I'm here as a journalist. Um, I think they wanted me to sort of use my, Marine connections to get uh, good interviews or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I really tried to keep it hidden. Mm -hmm. And um, 
one of the first people who met me on the ground in uh, in um, in the battalion that I was uh, embedded with uh, was like the first, literally was the first squad leader from my first platoon. Whoa. So wow. really small, really small world. Yeah. My cover was blown immediately. Uh, but uh, <laughs> he's like, welcome back. Particularly <laughs> enjoyable at the time with them. I'm, I'm curious to hear to segue into, you know, your transition. What was that like personally for you after the Marine Corps? Well, especially in between, right? Because yeah. you, you were going to grad school, but it sounds like you did have something that was kind of pulling you back. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like Bo said, I'm, I'm curious to know too, what that transition was like for you. In one word, hard. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I say that especially because I feel very lucky that I had some pretty incredible opportunities. Um, I mean, I got into Harvard Business School yeah. uh, and and uh, like Harvard Kennedy School. Um, so I got out actually after three tours. I applied, uh, was accepted, and 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 I just said um, it was a very very quick process. I was going to get out uh, just before a um, month or two before I started school. <coughs> Excuse me, and and. Uh, I tell you, I, I was like, this is too quick. I'm, I'm, I'm just re really not ready mm -hmm. to sit down in a classroom yet. Um, so I deferred, which is sort of a quirk of Harvard Business School. You're not allowed to defer. So I had to um, reapply. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did that because I felt like I'm just, this is too much. Like, I'm not ready to go to school yet. Mm -hmm. uh, while I was <laughs> in that interim year, um, I, I got called back to um, Iraq. So um, I went back on active duty and Jeez. did a fourth tour um, and then had to uh, apply again. And then I found when I got there that I really missed my Marines. I missed mm -hmm. being overseas and serving. And sometimes I'd find myself in the back of the classroom just saying like, God, this is so selfish and meaningless mm -hmm. compared to what I was doing and what a lot of my buddies are still doing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, there are a lot of times when I just felt pretty checked out and, uh, you know, hard to concentrate on, on, on schoolwork. And of course, you know, many people come back struggling with um, much more serious post-traumatic stress and have, uh, you know, trouble even just getting in a car and driving down the highway because mm -hmm. they're afraid of an IED blowing up or something. Yeah. So on the one hand, I felt very fortunate to have these amazing opportunities and, um, you know, I wasn't suicidal or anything like that. But at the same time, I have to tell you, like, it was not an easy transition. Mm. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that because yeah. I, there are, I don't know what it is, like just talking to people and things like that, but I, I feel like there is this unknown stigma of people thinking it's just an enlisted uh, issue, that transition piece, like officers have it easier like their, their transition out of the military is easier. And that's not the case. Majority of officers I've talked to one-on-one, -on -one, they also struggle with it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to hear that side of it and just let people know, like, it doesn't matter if you, you know, only were able to serve for a year because you got hurt and had to get out or you served for 35 years, you have this transition where it's just a complete change in your mindset, your, um, your environment, your, uh, actions with society, like everything is just completely different about it. And, uh, it, it's really important for people to hear that and know that it's not just again, like one side's problem. It's, it's all military has a hard time with transition for the most part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, let me say two quick things on that. First of all, uh, I was not only a captain when I got out, but my last job was reporting to a four-star general mm -hmm. and yet oh, wow. I had no idea how to even sign up for the VA. <laughs> so the military historically has just been terrible yep. at mm -hmm. managing this transition um, for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and the second thing I'd say is that, you know, coming to terms with my own post-traumatic stress was hard for a number of reasons, one of which was that I realized my symptoms weren't nearly as bad as uh, many others. And so I felt mm -hmm. almost guilty, you know, taking any resources from the VA or something like that to deal with my, you know, mm -hmm. bad dreams and nightmares and, you know, I, whatever, um, when other people were dealing with much worse. But at the end of the day, I really learned from the enlisted guys I served with mm -hmm. that talking about this helps. Yeah. Um, we all got together as a platoon, my second platoon, 
um, sadly for the funeral of one of our guys. And, um, and, and we all kind of started opening up and hearing them share some of their experiences made me realize how important it was for me to share mine. Yeah. And, um, and so I've been trying to do that a lot more ever since. Mm. Yeah, I have to, you know, I talk about it in the intro of the book and I I talk about it on this podcast all the time, but it, it took me eight years to get to a point to where I was really openly, I guess, talking to people about my service and, and what it meant to me. And, um, you know, the hard times, the good times, everything in between. And I can see that that's a problem within the veteran community. And I know people talk about it all the time, but the only way that we can encourage more people, more veterans to open up, up about their service is to have a, a wide array of people who have served mm-hmm. talk about their story. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for you to share it for this book. I'm grateful for you to share it in this podcast. And I think it's important for more and more veterans to step up. It doesn't matter, again, if you're lower enlisted or a four-star general, um, just talk about your service and what it meant to you. Again, the good, bad, and the ugly. Mm-hmm. So I think um, one of the most important things I've done in Congress is start an initiative called Veterans Town Halls. And mm. the idea, which really came um, from Sebastian Younger's uh uh, book tribe, uh, which he is quick to point out, really came from uh, American Indians, is to provide a forum for veterans to share some of their experiences in war and how they've impacted their lives back at home with with the broader community, not just with fellow veterans, but with all the people that we made these sacrifices to serve and are ultimately trying to understand us as we um, warriors come home. And mm-hmm. We did the first one ever a few years ago in my hometown of Marblehead, Massachusetts, birthplace of the American Navy, in fact, Mm -hmm. um, on Veterans Day. And I said, you know what, instead of just going out and clapping for a bunch of vets in a parade, why don't you come and listen and try to understand Mm -hmm. what we're all about? This is now spread across the country. And uh, there are veterans town halls on Veterans Day all over America. Um, And uh, I think it helps a lot because... uh, we need to share our stories more and Americans need to understand uh, what veterans are all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's definitely a disconnect if, if stories aren't told, but even more importantly, like history gets lost when you don't open up and and talk soon enough. Like there's all too many stories that came from world war two, the Korean war, Vietnam, Mm -hmm. you know, years, decades, you know, really lifetimes down the road that finally, veterans talk about their story but that was one of the main reasons that inspired me for this book was that i didn't want to wait i wanted veterans who've been serving to open up now and share their stories now Mm -hmm. and not wait you know 20 30 40 years down the road to open up and uh that's right and it's you know it's not my place to pass judgment on fellow vets but i i do think also it's important to say that what we're talking about here is is really sharing um the humble stories of, mm-hmm. of, of war, right? Um, I mean, you won't ever hear me going around and, you know, there I was, you know, <laughs> jumping through the way. Um, I think there's a healthy disrespect among serious veterans for just going around telling war stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but talking about uh, the very real struggles um, with um, all the moral dimensions of war, on the other hand, I think is incredibly important. Yeah, absolutely. You just have a completely different perspective that people who haven't served, it's really hard for them to to realize unless you give your perspective. And uh, again, that's that's what we're trying to do here and, and what we're going to continue to do. Um, but I'm really curious, kind of taking a, a step back a little bit, you know, going through your timeline some more. So you you served and went to grad school decided got called or was about to go to grad school got called back then went to grad school was a uh a journalist for a while then what were kind of the next steps and and what eventually called you to to congress yeah so like every aspiring massachusetts politician i took my first job in dallas texas the mm. the point being this was not my plan like i really did i didn't grow up interested in politics i didn't study it in school um, I don't come from a political family. In fact, I think the first congressman that my parents uh, met uh, was their son, this guy. Um, so th- this is very, very much not what I expected to be doing with my life. But, 
you know, at the end of the day, after four tours in Iraq, I really felt like I had seen some of the consequences of failed leadership, mm -hmm. failed Washington leadership. A bunch of people here in D.C. who had no idea what was going on on the ground and were making decisions, often bad decisions, that that affected our lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I didn't I didn't plan. I took a job in Dallas, but I got a call from a nonprofit that's trying to recruit veterans to run for office with the premise that, you know, maybe people who have made some real sacrifices in public service before would bring some of that spirit of servant leadership to Washington at a time when it's desperately needed, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. And uh, and ultimately, I thought about it a lot. And I, I guess more than anything, I thought back uh, to uh, just a tough day in 2004 in Iraq when Corporal in my platoon came up to me and said, I remember right where I was standing. And he said, um, you know, sir, you ought to run for Congress someday so that this shit doesn't happen again. Mm. And I kind of just said, you know what? Maybe maybe if men and women with my kind of experience, with that kind of experience, don't stand up and run, then, um, you know, it's never going to change. And, and, and this was 2013, 14. Um, We've never had fewer veterans in Congress in our nation's history yep. uh, mm -hmm. than at that time. It's come up a little bit, I think, not not too much. Yep. Um, but there was a time when a lot of people in Congress had the experience of going to war and therefore were a lot more thoughtful about sending other Americans. It's yeah. it's, inter it's interesting um, just by what you just said, because it's almost like that was your second calling. Like you mentioned previously, the Reverend who was mentioning to you, you should go on and serve. And then you get the second opportunity, hey, you should go serve for Congress and make a change there. So you've been kind of following this path of helping others your whole life. Well, not my whole life, honestly. Um, not until after college. I mean, I kind of just, like every other American kid, mm -hmm. just tried to um, do do well in school and, you know, uh, do decently in sports and, you know, try to get into a good school or whatever else. But um, you know, what one of the things that Marine Corps taught me is that I really, I really like to serve. Mm -hmm. uh, that I, I, I find it, um, you know, not only important but I guess personally rewarding. And um, yeah, I mean, this is look. Th this is a very difficult time to be in Washington. I mean, mm -hmm. the the partisanship, the tribalism, um, mm -hmm. it's terrible. I mean, uh, you know, just. You know, I mean, you look at look at all the terrible things people say about me on the internet any given day of the week, right? No matter what you do. Um, uh, but I think it's a really important time to be here mm -hmm. yeah. because of that in many ways. Yeah. And, um, you know, I often tell people it is a tremendous privilege to have this job. And it's the second best job I've ever had. Well, I, th I think it's important. I mean, I met up with you in person, obviously, there in Massachusetts. And I think you deserve to give yourself more credit than you do. You're a great man. And it was great to have that time with you. You know, the, it was short lived, but to capture your photo and, and hear your story. And, and we're glad to have you on tonight. But I'm interested to hear kind of to elaborate. I was glad you got to meet my daughter. She's the real star. Yes, the that's true. <laughs> Although now she's got photo. a sister too. So there's, there's a lot of competition. Oh, that. man. <laughs> well, congratulations on that, um, on your second daughter. But I I'm curious to hear what parallels or lessons have you learned between being in the uniform and now serving in Congress? Well, you know, at its core, um, that public service should be the same. I mean, mm -hmm. you should, um, uh, you know, live up to your oath. And you literally swear the exact same oath mm -hmm. as a member of Congress that I swore when, um, you know, when I took that oath of office as a Marine Corps officer. Mm -hmm. And yet I think a lot of people around here forget that mm -hmm. and think that they're here to serve their own political interests or their party's political interests rather than the Constitution, mm -hmm. the Constitution of the United States, our American values that are enshrined in that Constitution. So I wish more people in Washington remembered that and mm -hmm. were always willing to put their country first, mm -hmm. um, always willing to do what's right, even if there's great political costs, you know? Um, and um, so that's what I, that's what I try to do every day. You know, when I, when I first ran for office, um, 
that first campaign, I was running against an 18 year incumbent. I mean, this is how little I knew about politics. I didn't know you weren't supposed to take on an 18 year incumbent in your own party. Um, a lot of people didn't like me for that. Uh, but um, yeah, I didn't meet a lot of people, thousands mm. of conversations, right? The single most memorable was with a World War II veteran, mm. fought in the Pacific in the Navy. And I came up to him in a diner and explained that I was a veteran as well. And I was running for office. And I, honestly, I thought he'd be impressed by this. He wasn't that impressed. He didn't have very much to say. But he said one thing. He said, Seth, promise me that if you win this race, you will go to Washington as an American. Mm -hmm. Not as a Democrat or as a Republican, but as an American. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the kind of congressman that I've tried to be every day. And, and that's exactly the kind of Marines that I served with. Yeah. Man. You know, I think there's a really important theme there that you kind of were touching on from from the last few questions um congress has certainly gotten more divided but the like you said less people who have served in the military are also in congress right now mm -hmm. um the lowest it's ever been i think the highest it was in the almost 80 percent yeah. yeah um you know after world war ii the korean war around the vietnam time it was around 80 percent of congress now was, it's 20 made up right. yeah and now it's less than 20 um and it's just crazy to see that. But I, I think that does show the divide and just how when you come from a place of serving, it doesn't matter what your beliefs are, you know, your specific beliefs, your skin color, your race, your origins, you're just there to serve and serve a better cause, a bigger cause than yourself. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree. I think a lot of veterans would carry that forward into Congress. And I would hope a lot of people who are serving in Washington would learn that from veterans or more veterans would step up and serve in Congress. And you're definitely certainly seeing that I've, I've seen, you know, numerous more, um, you know, veterans stepping up running for Congress. And, and I think it's great. And I think more should, um, but, uh, that service piece I think is the key mm. is just to realize what does it mean to truly serve others and serve selflessly and it's something that you don't just get overnight. It's something you learn in the military for for sure. You can learn it elsewhere, but when when your life is on the line, there's no other greater no greater way to learn what it means to serve selflessly. Look, I, I think you're right, and um, uh, I started an organization called Serve America to help elect um, more National Service veterans, and um, we've we supported a lot of. Uh, uh, military men and women, but um, but also other people who've done national service, like, like works in the State Department or um, even AmeriCorps, or Teach for America, or things like that, Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. um, I found I have a lot of I have a lot in common with mm -hmm. other people who serve the country, even in a more civilian um, type of capacity. Now, look, being a veteran doesn't doesn't mean you're you're automatically uh, a good person, mm -hmm. and we have a great caucus, bipartisan caucus of veterans. Uh, here in the House of Representatives. We do a lot of work together. They're some of the first people that I go to if I want to introduce a new piece of legislation and I'm looking for a co-sponsor across the aisle. Um, but I'm thinking of one veteran that we recently kicked out um, because mm -hmm. he was just too partisan mm -hmm. and he clearly was not putting the country first. Mm -hmm. And, yep. uh, you know, so, so so being a veteran doesn't give you carte blanche to, to be a good yeah. um, person or a member of Congress. But but on average, I think it's, it definitely is true that having that service ethic from um, from some prior experience serving the country really helps when you get to Washington. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I want to be conscious of time a little bit here, but I, I do want to talk about um, kind of everything that's that's happened in Afghanistan. And I, I think it's really important to, to talk about this because one, it's it's been I guess the biggest event that's happened obviously this year, you could certainly say COVID is a bigger event because it's a global event. But as far as what has affected veterans here in this country, I would say Afghanistan and the fall of Afghanistan has probably affected them the most. Um, and the results of that and the fallout and the gold star families and things and people I've heard from that just feel kind of let down from their service, but I've, you know, we've all done a pretty decent job of, of saying, no, you didn't, your service was meaningless. You served a great cause and you did make a change. Mm -hmm. Um, 
But I do want to go back to, you know, some of your early efforts. I know you were one of the the major voices in Congress that was talking about, you know, how we need to ramp up getting people out of Afghanistan, especially the SIV applicants and, and you know, expediting that process. But if you can kind of talk about your role and, and really, I guess, your vision or what you brought into Congress before the fall of Afghanistan. Well, first of all, the, you know, the administration reached out and asked for my thoughts and advice uh, before the president made the decision to withdraw. And I had a lot of reservations. I thought that mm-hmm. he could dramatically um, reduce the scope of our mission and our true presence. Uh, but I wasn't sure that it would be in our best national security interest to just completely withdraw. Mm-hmm. But after he made the decision to withdraw, I made it very clear that we've got to start getting people out. Yeah. And um, I expressed these views you know, privately with the White House and with the State Department and the Department of Defense. And then when I didn't feel they were um, moving quickly enough, uh, I expressed them publicly. And in mm-hmm. fact, when uh, Chairman Milley and Secretary Austin, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Secretary of Defense, came before the House Armed Services Committee in June, mm. in June, long before the August yeah. uh, withdrawal, in June, I said, my first question to that was, why have you not started this evacuation already? Mm-hmm. Clearly. We need to get people out while we can, but they didn't. Mm-hmm. And so it was a last ditch effort, um, essentially after the country had already fallen to the Taliban. Mm-hmm. That's why it was so chaotic. It didn't have to be that way. Uh, we could have conducted a very orderly uh, evaluation, uh, vetting of people, um, just like happens in any embassy anywhere in the world where mm-hmm. people are applying for visas to come to the United States. And we could have done that um, with many more resources on the ground and um, and had the vast majority of, of our allies out well before um, the Taliban was anywhere near Kabul. Mm-hmm. But what happened instead was an amazing story of veterans from across America and even across the world. I mean, yeah. some of our allies. Yeah. Yeah. I've been talking with the, uh, some of the uh, some some MPs, ministers of parliament in the UK who are veterans just like me, who'd served um, there and, and, and worked with uh, with American vets to get our people out. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, look, I was one of those guys just like I'm sure you were, um, up all night on phone calls with Signal and WhatsApp or whatever else we could do to get in touch with people and literally mm-hmm. sometimes talk them you know, through the gate yeah. at Kabul International Airport um, to get them to safety. I'm curious as we wrap up on the last couple of things with you, what are the next steps on that same topic and how can people help? Well, number one, and this is absolutely the most important thing, we still have a lot of people that we yeah, left behind. Absolutely. And we can't forget that because um, there are a lot of people who need help getting resettled in the United States and everything. But, but number one is we still have people we've left behind yeah. a lot. Number two is we we all um, can play a great role in welcoming these Afghan and American heroes, people who risk their lives not just for their country but for ours, welcoming into our communities. I, mean, I can't wait for some of these folks to be um, my neighbors. Mm-hmm. Uh, I worked hard to get a lot of my translators uh, from Iraq uh, here to America, and uh, they've become really good friends. And um, you know, come to my wedding and you know, see them for Christmas and. And holidays, um, my friend Muhammad, we're hoping will come for Christmas. He, he traditionally has done a lot of holidays with my family up in Massachusetts. And I mean, these are amazing people. Mm-hmm. Um, but we want to make sure they get back on their feet. Because imagine if you had to pack everything you own in a, in a bag. You might be a college professor. I mean, most of these Afghans spoke multiple languages. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> more talented than, than me. Um, but they didn't have time to sell their house. No. They didn't have time to pull money out of the bank. They put everything they owned. No, they had to put. They had to pick the things they owned, put in a suitcase, yep. and get on a plane. And pick their So they're life. coming here with nothing. They've got to start from scratch, and we can help them with that. Yeah, yeah. you know, I was just talking to somebody who's uh, uh, working out at Fort McCoy and and helping with Save Our Allies, and just some of the stories that you know they've told me is just heartwarming and also gut wrenching because. Some of the some of the stories are obviously the ones that inspire you, and it's like, mm. 
I'm, I'm so excited about what America does mean to these people who literally left their lives behind to try for a new life here in America. And they're, they're proud and they're excited. They want to get started. They, they want to do something to contribute and thank us and, and give back to Americans. But then the other side of it is they're just completely heartbroken to see what's happening in Afghanistan. The, the people that they've, they've left behind their extended families, their friends, their neighbors, and, uh, you know, th- this friend of mine actually sent me a photo, um, that an eight year old Afghan girl drew and it was just like, it, it honestly like gave me chills and I was almost in tears because half of the photo was the United States and half of it had a, a heart in it. And, um, you know, it was her family and, and it was happy. And then on the other side was Afghanistan and the other side of the heart and the other side of the Afghan flag. And it was bodies falling from the sky and blood everywhere. And I was just like, are you kidding me? She drew that? And she was like, yes. And that's just something that until you see it come from a child, that's when you realize like the amount of pain and suffering that these people have gone through. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it it needs to be in our hearts as Americans to, to help, to help others who cannot help themselves. And especially those that have been there to help us. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, this is why Representative Meyer and myself, Peter Meyer from Michigan, you know, went to Kabul yeah. um, to hope we were hoping to extend um, the timeline. Uh, we realized once we got there and understood the nuances of the situation with the Taliban that we weren't able to do that. But, um, you know, even just to save a few more lives. And I don't care about the critics uh, yeah. in Washington who complained about our trip, uh, uh, the troops on the ground knew why we were there and um it it's really an amazing story of how so many veterans have come together to uh to fight uh, yeah. for these afghans but yeah. unfortunately there's still a lot more work to do yeah i hope uh I, I hope people are inspired by this because you know we could be sad and we could be upset and we could take the time to to obviously reflect on all of that but um one thing that i want people to get out of this is like it it didn't end back in August and September. Mm -hmm. There are still people getting out of Afghanistan. There are still people getting resettled in multiple countries throughout the world, not just the U S and they need assistance and people need to not forget about it. And, uh, even though it's not in the news cycle every day anymore, um, it's absolutely something that, that people can do small things and make a huge difference huge difference in uh, other people's lives Mm -hmm. and really impact them to, to really give them, you know, a little bit of the American dream and uh, be excited to be here. And I hope that's what people do. Um, you know, as, as we kind of wrap up, I I do want to ask like, what is next for you is, uh, you know, I know you're, you're still in Congress. I know you voting, uh, crazy day of voting today to try and keep the uh, government and the country open and running. Uh, but like, what's, what's next? Do you have any aspirations? I know you've got some things you're working on. Uh, anything you want to share? Uh, well, by the way, let me first say that the um, bill that I just voted for uh, to continue fighting the government is not, not perfect. Um, but one of the reasons I voted for it is mm. because it includes uh, more funding for exactly what we're talking mm. about, Tom, continuing to help get Afghans out and, uh, so I, I hope that uh, you'll recognize that those of us who voted for this today, because that's one of the things that it does. I mean, look, <coughs> excuse me, it's a tough time to be in Washington, yeah. but I love this job. Mm-hmm. It's an honor to do it every day. Um, it's an honor to continue helping people and influencing our foreign policy and decisions that are made uh, that affect our troops. To sit on the House Armed Services Committee, with literally oversight of the DOD, um, getting our troops what they need. And, um, and I look forward to continuing to do it. Um, you know, I'm always going to look for the best way I can to serve the country. And I think right now it's, it's right here, um, mm-hmm. on, uh, on Capitol Hill. What are your, I guess, uh, a parting word, uh, words of encouragement, especially for veterans as a veteran yourself, um, you know, as they go through transition, as we leave major wars like the, the GWAT and other things, um, you know, what are, what are some words of encouragement you would give to, to veterans? Well, first of all, I would say, um, do your best to stay in touch with your fellow vets. Um, the last time I got together with uh, a 
bunch of the Marines I served with was just a couple of weeks ago um, down in Louisiana for the dedication of a highway to a mm. uh, great hero, Lance Corporal Larry Wells, who, who died in Najaf in 2004. And, um, you know, just realize that you're not there, you're not out there alone. Mm. That, uh, a lot of people are struggling with the transition or figuring out how to make sense of uh, life back here at home. Um, you know, look, I've got this great office here in Washington, and I'm still struggling with that, trying to figure it all out and trying to help other vets with that transition, too. And the second thing is to remember that, you know, what you did was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, the most extraordinary thing was just signing up, being mm -hmm. willing to volunteer to put your life on the line for America. This country has been built, built on volunteers for, for centuries, mm -hmm. uh, people who uh, were willing to risk everything for the principles that the values that America stands for. And we can't lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's a lot of tribalism, a lot of bickering, um, a lot of hate out there right now in a very divided America. Let's not lose sight of our core American values. Let's mm -hmm. not lose sight of that constitution. And uh, remember that at the end of the day, um, it's about standing up for those values not adhering to one leader or mm -hmm. principle, not um, curtailing freedom, but expanding it. Mm. Uh, being willing to question each other critically, have critical thought. That's essential to a democracy. Absolutely. I really, really scared about these efforts to like ban books or burn <laughs> books. I mean, that's what they do in China. Yeah. That's what they, they Hitler did in Germany. You know, we got to stay true to our American values that we fought for overseas, that we worked hard to extend to other people who don't have them all around the globe. Mm -hmm. Make sure we remember those right here at home. And I think veterans who have literally risked their lives for those ideals um, can be real champions of American values in the years ahead. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Well, Congressman Moulton, uh, like Dan said, we don't want to take much of your night, but we appreciate you being on our podcast. Yeah. We appreciate your support in our book, The 20-Year War, and we look forward to connecting with you hopefully soon in the future. Yeah. Well, it's an honor to be here with you guys. Thanks yeah. for having me. Thanks again. Of course. Thank you.